Imagine if you were a bottom feeding catfish with these chemoreceptors scattered across the entire surface of your body. Existentially speaking, are you a nose with fins or a tongue with fins? Sensory receptor cells are the basic units that allow animals to monitor what's happening within and outside their bodies and translate that information into electrical impulses. They can appear as simple nerve endings or as more complex structures, the sense organs. Classifying sense organs can be based on four main criteria which are not mutually exclusive. For example, the eye is a special somatic visual photoreceptive exteroceptive sense organ. At least for today's lecture, we will group these sense organs based on distribution. General sense organs are distributed throughout the body, while special sense organs are more localized to a specific area, and this is typically the head. Somatic sense organs provide information about the external environment, while visceral receptors provide information about the organism's internal environment. Say you're on vacation on a white sand beach, enjoying a session of sunset yoga. Despite that overall feeling of relaxation, your general sensory receptors are working hard. Visceral receptors that constantly monitor oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in your blood make sure that you inhale and exhale on cue. Cutaneous receptors allow you to perceive the warmth from the sun, the cool, gentle breeze, your feet pressing onto the fine white sand. Then suddenly, you feel a sharp, needle-like prick and realize you've been bitten by a sandhopper. That distracting pain puts you slightly off balance, but your proprioceptors were able to sense this and help you regain your footing with the help of your arms. <laughs> General sensory receptors are fairly similar across different vertebrates, but special sensory organs are, well, special. The special somatic receptors allow the animal to sense light, vibrations, and temperature. Before we move on, I highly suggest you first watch these videos from Crash Course to familiarize yourselves with the anatomy of the human special sense organs. Sabi nga raw, before you get to know others, you must first know thyself. When you live in water, the deeper you go, the darker it gets. So light sensing structures are only really useful up to a certain depth. But what persists throughout the entire water column is the fact that water molecules are always jiggling and bumping into each other, and that water is actually a pretty decent electrical conductor. Luckily, evolution came up with the neuromass organ, and it is composed of two cells. Hair cells are mainly responsible for detecting and translating water movements, and they are supported by the sustentacular cells. When arranged in linear series from head to tail, you end up with a lateral line system. If they're mainly on the head, then they make up the cephalic canal system. Some neuromasts can also detect electric currents and are often observed in cartilaginous fishes. The ampullae of Lorenzini of sharks being the most popular example of these electroreceptive neuromass organs. And if you remember what we said about evolution coming up with problem-solving structures without making strong assumptions about the environment, we see this pan out again in the inner ear. Because guess what? It's basically a complex of neuromass organs. This time, it is found deep within the head so as not to pick up external water movements, but instead detect the movement of the fluid inside it. The membranous labyrinth is part of the inner ear found in all vertebrates, and it is responsible for maintaining physical equilibrium within our surrounding environment. The neuromass in semicircular canals oriented along three planes of movement detect pitching, yawing, and rolling while those in the utriculus and sacculus detect linear movements like forwards and backwards and ascending and descending. In fishes, those are the main chambers of the inner ear, with the sacculus having an outpocketing called the legina. This role of detecting water movements and equilibration was expanded further to include actual hearing when these neuromasts slowly became more sensitive to the different properties of vibrations, such as frequency and amplitude. Some fishes are capable of hearing and do so by using their swim bladders as resonators. Some also use modified bits of their vertebrae, called Weberian ossicles, to transmit vibrations from the swim bladder to the membranous labyrinth. In amniotes, the hearing portion of the inner ear is called the organ of corti, which is located in the legina. In birds and mammals, the legina elongates and coils to become the cochlea, the hearing part of the inner ear. 
inner ear pa lang tayo. Meron pang middle ear and outer ear. But don't worry, because from here, it gets easier. So far, we've dealt with vibrations moving through the same medium, water. But when you live on land, vibrations from the environment move through air. The challenge is to be able to amplify those vibrations to move the liquid in the inner ear. Because as we all know, moving water is much harder than moving air. And if you're thinking, well, why not just have an air-filled inner ear? Just take out the water from the inner ear. The neuromasts will most likely collapse and they won't be able to do their job. That's what the middle ear is all about. It is mainly responsible for amplifying sound waves and transmitting them to the inner ear. So the eardrum provides a large surface area that picks up vibrations from the outside. The oval window, which is a secondary tympanic membrane, is a smaller membrane in contact with the inner ear. Connecting these two membranes are the middle ear bones. The columella, or the stapes, is found in all tetrapods, which if you remember was once part of the hyoid arch. Only mammals have two additional middle ear bones the malleus and incus, which are derived from the articular and quadrate bones respectively. If you remember, skeletal system. And because physics, pressure equals force over a given unit of area. When you concentrate the same amount of vibrational forces received by the larger eardrum onto a smaller oval window, the pressure exerted effectively increases. In addition, the configuration of the three middle ear bones in mammals has better leverage. They're not like set out straight like that, but they're actually in angles to each other. So there's more lever action going on, thereby generating more force moving the oval window and ultimately the endolymph of the inner ear. In some animals, the eardrum is flush with the surface of the head, as is the case with most reptiles and amphibians. So if you've seen those toads with that round thing right there, boop, that's the eardrum. What about animals that don't have an eardrum? like snakes and some amphibians. They use their bones to conduct sound to their inner ears. But notice that these organisms typically drag their bodies across the ground. They actually have the added perk of picking up vibrations from the ground. We get to the easiest bit, which is the outer ear. It is composed of the pinnae, these guys, and the outer ear canal. Yung nililinis ninyo ng cotton buds. Crocodiles, birds, and mammals have an outer ear canal. But only mammals have the pinnae. The pinnae of mammals capture sound, and the size and shape of the pinnae can say a lot about the animal in general. Insectivorous bats, for example, have insanely large pinnae, which they use for echolocation to catch prey. Aquatic mammals have reduced to no pinnae to maintain a streamlined body shape. But that doesn't mean that they can't hear. Even though snakes don't have limbs, some snakes have pits. Vipers have l'oreal pits, while pythons and boas have labial pits. And angelinas have brad pits. Shit, I have to stop making these jokes. Both l'oreal and labial pits are thermoreceptors, with l'oreal pits being the more sensitive of the two. This is mainly because snakes don't exactly have the best vision or hearing. Not to mention, they lack limbs. So they really need all the help they can get to find something they eat. Last in the list of special somatic receptors are the eyes. They come in two main types, the paired lateral eyes and the median eye. Crash course, as usual, details the structure of the human eye. And if you still haven't, Watch it. As you can see, the eyes of different vertebrates more or less have the same structures. And all evolution has to do is arrange and or shape these same structures a little bit differently. And the way an animal sees the world can become life-changing indeed. The variations just of the eyes themselves can tell us so much about a typical day in the life of a vertebrate. The overall shape of the eyeball isn't always spherical. They may, for example, be tubular, as in owls and barrel eye fish. The conjunctiva is that very thin film of skin that covers the entirety of the visible surface of the eye when the eyelids are open. This keeps the eye moist and somehow protected. Of course, that is together with the glands that actually produce moisture for the eye. In snakes and a few lizards, the eyelids are permanently closed. How can they see? The eyelids are transparent, forming a spectacle that comes off when they shed their epidermis. Kaya lumalabo, di ba, yung mata pag nagmamolting? Kasi yun na yun, natatanggal na yung 
nag-expecta kayo. The sclera is the white portion of the eyeball. Anytime you hear sclero or sclera, it means rock. Why? In some vertebrates, the sclera is actually hardened by cartilage or bone. Reinforcing the eye this way can help maintain its shape. In birds, squamates, and turtles, these bones are called sclerotic rings. And they are especially thick in species that are exposed to impact forces from diving, constant water pressure, or high velocities in general. The transparent avascular continuation of the sclera is the cornea. In terrestrial vertebrates, this is mainly responsible for focusing light into the eye because of the drastic difference with the way light bends in air versus water. In fishes, the cornea and the surrounding water have nearly equal refractive indices, so the lens is a structure that is mainly used for focusing. The retina contains neurons and the photoreceptors that detect light. Rods absorb the entire visible spectrum of light thanks to the pigment rhodopsin. Cones only absorb certain wavelengths of light, either in blues, reds, or greens. Hence, they are attributed to color vision. Vertebrates that live in really dark habitats, be they the depths of the ocean, pitch black caves, or underground, have little to no cones. Wala namang point eh. Could hardly see any color when it's dark. Diurnal animals, on the other hand, have more cones than rods, with a high number of these jam-packed in the fovea. Some vertebrates even have two foveas in each eye. The choroid coat is the highly vascularized black film in between the sclera and the retina and functions to nourish the eye. In some animals, especially nocturnal ones, a portion of it is reflective, and it is called the tapetum lucidum. This maximizes low light conditions by reflecting the light back into the retina. <laughs> The choroid coat may also have highly vascularized folds sticking into the vitreous chamber, allowing for metabolic exchange between the blood and the eye. Once the choroid coat extends past the sclera, it can be seen through the cornea as the iris diaphragm. The hole in the middle of the iris is the pupil. Its size can be controlled by dilator and constrictor muscles in response to changes in light intensity. The shape of the pupil is hypothesized to vary based on the feeding strategy and dial activity of the animal. Nocturnal predators that lie close to the ground typically have vertical pupils, while prey animals that need a panoramic view of the landscape to scan for predators have horizontal pupils. Round and subcircular pupils are all around pupils that work fairly well both daytime and nighttime. At the periphery of the iris diaphragm is the ciliary body, which is a ring of muscles that together with the suspensory ligament can change the shape of the lens. The ciliary processes produce the echinus humor that nourishes the cornea. Because remember, the cornea is avascular. Together with the choroid, the iris diaphragm, and the ciliary body are also sometimes called the uvea. The lens focuses light onto the retina and its shape may differ among vertebrates. The muscles of the iris diaphragm and ciliary body are intrinsic eye muscles, which in reptiles are made of striated muscles, allowing for faster adaptation to changes in light intensity or focus. In mammals and amphibians, these intrinsic eye muscles are made of smooth muscles, so it takes a considerable amount of time for our eyes to accommodate. And what is that? Accommodation is the reflex ability to adjust the eye, to view objects at different distances and or lighting conditions. In the case of amniote eyes, except snakes, we focus on objects by changing the shape of the lens itself. In fishes, the lens stays the same, but it just moves within the eye. But what if I don't want no eyes? No problem. Moles, hogfishes, and other vertebrates that live in caves have vestigial or no eyes altogether. Evolution is all-inclusive. Aside from lateral eyes, many vertebrates, except birds and mammals, also have a third eye, the median eye. Lampreys have both parapineal and pineal eyes that connect to the right and left sides of the diencephalon, respectively. Lizards have just the parapineal eye, which is also known as the parietal eye. Median eyes do not form images, but they are light sensitive to monitor the duration of daylight, and ultimately, this helps in regulating the body's circadian rhythms and other photoperiod related aspects of its life. So kapag may tao na nagsabi sa'yo na meron siyang third eye, ibang usapan na yun, tumakbo na po kayo, may kasama na siguro siya sa likod niya na hindi ninyo nakikita dahil wala kayong third eye. Taste and smell are the means by which we sense the chemical makeup of our surroundings. It is difficult to discuss taste and smell independently because a lot of the things we associate with taste are actually because of our sense of smell. And you can try it for yourself, as in close your nose while you're eating something and you'll notice that it tastes bland. Now if you do this, for example, with boiled chicken, pork, and beef, you won't know which is pork, chicken, or beef. 
in water, the chemicals are just dissolved there. So the nasal passages simply have to be positioned in such a way that the water current constantly passes through them. Most fishes have nasal sacs that form a one-way path for water to enter and then exit. If you're a fish following a stream of chemicals, having this one-way flow of water ensured there was always a fresh supply of water to wash out the chemicals so that new chemicals could stick to the olfactory epithelium. Eventually, the mechanisms for respiration helped draw water into the olfactory passageways, paving the way for how tetrapods smell and breathe and how they do that at the same time. In tetrapods, our olfactory sensory neurons are covered with mucus in order to provide a watery medium for the volatile odor chemicals to dissolve into. Volatile chemicals floating in the air are brought into our nasal cavities with each inhale. And when our olfactory neurons pick up something from that, from that inhale, we can actively sniff to increase the chemicals entering our nostril. <laughs> Amphibians, reptiles, and some mammals have vomeronasal organs. These are accessory olfactory chemoreceptors said to play a role in detecting pheromones and prey. These are typically found in the roof of the mouth near the vomer, hence the name. This explains why reptiles flick their forked tongues frequently. The tongue picks up the chemicals from the air and then brings them into these organs. Crocodiles, birds, some bats, aquatic mammals, and most turtles do not have this. Taste receptors, also called the taste buds, detect chemicals in the oral cavity. In mammals, these are typically found in the tongue, but for fishes and other tetrapods, they can be found in the roof, sides, and walls of the pharynx as well. They are found across the body surfaces of bottom feeding or scavenging fish. In trying to understand the importance of sense organs, it might be helpful to sort them out based on what stimuli they're actually trying to perceive and tying that in with the life history of the animals you're studying. Why do animals need to sense light? At least on Earth, life loves light. Of course, there are organisms that are adapted to living in complete darkness, but majority of life on Earth relies on sunlight. And where there is light, there are plants. For us animals, plants are food. Until such time that we can make our own food, we need to stay close to the ones that do. And aside from food, there are other things that we should be able to see, like mates. Danger. Holy sh**. So remember that we are made of protein. And if you've ever cooked an egg, you know that proteins can only really work well within an optimum temperature range. So being able to sense ambient temperature allows animals to actively move towards the Goldilocks zone of not too hot, not too cold. Otherwise, they'll have to find ways to survive in more extreme temperatures or they just stop being alive. Where light sometimes can't reach, sounds and smells can, and also, of course, temperature gradients. Now, the ability to detect these can tell you a bunch of things. If dinner is right around the corner, or if you are about to be someone else's dinner, or where your kids or your parents are, or where your lover is. Tactile sensation is important because sometimes you can't see, hear, or smell anything. So you could at least feel something. Hey, the earth is shaking. Maybe we should get out of here. This fruit is pretty soft. Maybe I can eat it now. Wh where is that? Oh, oh, okay, there it is. In summary, our sense organs mainly exist to detect and monitor the three Fs. Food, friends, and fuckers. I sense that you want to know more. This is by no means the end all and be all of sense organs. Your main references will provide the details on the ontogeny of the sense organs, as well as the nerves that innervate the special sensory receptors, among many things. And have a go at these videos as well. I will see you next time for the endocrine system.